Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just turned to the noon hour. Uh, so happy lunch hour. Um, we totally understand if uh, this is your lunch break and you're eating and you need to keep your camera off, we totally get that. But if you can put your camera on, uh, we would appreciate it. Uh, it is a large group here. Um, we have over 50 so far, more probably going to be joining. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jay Mason. I'm the director of the Project at the program at the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute, CSI for short. Um, and so I will be facilitating and driving the session today, uh, handling the technical um, aspects of Zoom and things like that. Uh, Carolyn is also on and also as a co-host. And if you have other uh, questions, you can also chat her. Uh, she has that functionality as well. Um, today, we have a jam-packed session. We've got an uh, overview of ECHO. It's hopefully going to take about five minutes. Um, and then we have a presentation from Nance Roy, who's on. And then we also have a case presentation. And so over that case presentation, we will go through and uh, have a discussion. We'll also hopefully uh, prime everyone else to hopefully submit a case for the upcoming sessions after they've seen one done. Um, so those are the big three agenda items, and then we'll do any housekeeping at the end. Um, the session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, and you will get that private link after the uh, session in our recap. Um, so if you do have to hop off early or anything like that, you will be able to catch up afterwards. Um, and again, if you have any questions at any point during the session, please feel free to use the chat or raise your hand. Uh, we will do our best to make sure we catch everybody. Like I said, it is a large group, which is great. But um, if anything falls through the cracks or you feel like yeah, you didn't get your uh, question answered, please let us know. Uh, we want to make sure we're mindful of that. So with that being said, um, for all the new people that have just joined, I'll just say one more time in the chat, please feel free to introduce yourself. Put your name, your email, your organization, and your credentials. The chat is being uh, recorded, so for attendance and also CE credits. Um, so please feel free to drop that in there. Um, are there any questions before we, we jump in? Seeing some no shaking heads. Okay, we'll go ahead and move forward. I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna do a quick overview of Echo and then really get into the meat of things here. Give me one second. Okay, is everybody able to see that? Thumbs up. Okay, good deal. All right, so we are going to, whoops, got ahead of myself. So um, we're gonna give a quick overview of the ECHO model for those who aren't familiar. Um, it might be a term you've heard before, Project ECHO and the ECHO model, but we're just gonna give a quick overview of what that is and what to expect in the sessions moving forward. So the ECHO model is a type of telemedicine model. That's how we typically describe it. Um, the difference is instead of that being traditional telemedicine of point to point, so provider to patient, um, we use it as a hub and spoke model where you have a group of specialists on one end that we call the hub. And then the spoke sites are your primary care providers, or in this case, uh, behavioral health specialists, campus mental health people. It can be a spoke, can be anybody. It doesn't have to just be medical people. Um, and so it's really this training and mentoring model hopefully uh, expand knowledge base and also be able to treat clients or patients in the uh, normal primary care or local setting longer before having to do other things or send them to specialists, for example. There's four core principles to the ECHO model. Uh, use of technology, which unfortunately with COVID, we are all very familiar with. Uh, we amplify Zoom, uh, we have to use Zoom for these. Um, we also, but the big two are, are B and C, uh, which is best practices. ECHO is all about sharing best practices, getting the most current knowledge out to everybody who needs it, not only in the spokes, but also the hub. Um, and then it's case-based learning. We're going to have a case today. Uh, the cases are really what drive the sessions. And when we say case, it's, it's not your, doesn't have to be a traditional case. It can be a policy or practice question. It could be about a group of clients that you typically see and see kind of similarities and you have questions about that. So it can be anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, a strict, this is about this de-identified person and I need to know these answers. It can be a, a many, many different things. 
And then the last one is really kind of an internal one for us, but it's using uh, databases to monitor outcomes. We have a requirement through the ECHO Institute, which is out of the University of New Mexico to track the sessions, track all the people that come and, and things like that. Okay, some quick tips and tricks for the sessions. Let's try to be mindful of time. It's an hour and the hour can go by quick. Um, please turn on your video if you can. We've talked about that. It is the lunch hour, so we totally understand if you are keeping your camera off to eat. Um, remember that there is the raise hand function uh, available, especially with our large group here. That'll really help uh, myself and also Carolyn kind of keep track of who has a question. Uh, no PHI, and that is something that is an echo-wide rule. Everything is de-identified. We don't want any PHI whatsoever on the sessions. Um, as a note, we are recording this. If we feel like there's any chance there can be PHI or something that can be tied back, that part of the recording is deleted and not uploaded at all. So don't worry about that. We just don't upload everything. If we feel like there's any issues, we'll just not do it. Um, feel free to direct message uh, myself or Carolyn if you have any questions or feel free to put it in the chat in general. Um, silence is good. Okay, so when we get to the cases, there are going to be some questions that are that are asked and uh, nobody might have an answer and that's okay. Everybody's sitting there and thinking, um, don't worry, I'm not frozen or the internet is not frozen. We're just waiting for everybody to kind of marinate and get, uh, get their thoughts together. Remember to mute and unmute. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that now, uh, being on Zoom so much. And then obviously we wanna treat everybody with respect. This is a safe place to learn and you know, express your opinions. Um, and then let's try to have some fun. Um, you'll figure out with me pretty soon that I don't take myself too seriously. I like to try to keep it light and positive. And so hopefully we can do that here as well uh, since we are gonna be talking about some very serious topics. Just a quick reminder on what the curriculum looks like moving forward. Um, we really wanna have collaborative discussions around these topics. So please feel free to raise your hand, put questions in the chat. And then if there's anything else that you feel like you might wanna learn about for future sessions or, or anything like that, also please let us know. We're always uh, wanting to make sure the content is fresh and also very, uh, very you know, what you guys need, what you, what you need to learn uh, and need to know when handling these situations. And then uh, finally, this is just, we got up some questions from the Zoom registration. Um, and so we want to address those real quick. We are going to have a session on SUD. That is going to be the last session, the sixth session. So we are going to have that. We're still working on the uh, presenter for that session, but that will be happening. Um, we are offering continuing education credits. So that again, that's why we're asking for all the information in the chat. And then we are going to be recording them and placing them in our on our YouTube uh, page. It is a private YouTube page. It, well, the link is going to come directly to to the group that attends, so it's not uh, public or anything like that. So you sh you shouldn't worry about privacy issues. And like I said before, if there's any issues with the case presentation or anything like that, we will delete that part of the recording or just delete the recording in general and not post that one. This is the ECHO team. It's not just me. I believe Mitra and Elizabeth are on here observing, uh, but they are really the all-stars for running these sessions. Um, and so they are on. If you have any questions at any point on the sessions, off the sessions, please feel free to email us. Um, you will get these slides afterwards um, as part of the recaps. So all the links that have been in the, in the slides, you will be able to access so our YouTube page and also the uh, CTSI Project ECHO page. That is it for my slides. Let me stop share here real quick and check the chat to make sure there are not any questions. Thank you, Carolyn, for putting in the reminder in the chat. We have any questions or are we looking at mainly? Okay, looking at attendance mainly. Okay, if there are not any other questions, we'll move things along, but let me let me pause here. Anything about Echo or what to expect? Feel free to unmute, ask away. Okay, congratulations. You just practiced your first silence is good uh, part of Echo here. Um, so remember, it's okay. 
Um, we're going to go ahead and move on um, to the presentation from Nance Roy. Nance, feel free to unmute. I'm going to share my screen again and pull up your slides. Please introduce yourself and uh, just let me know when you need to move to the next slide and I will take care of it for you. Thanks, Jay, as I am not great with technology, so I appreciate you managing the slides. Um, I'm Nancy Roy. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at the JED Foundation. Um, I do have a slide that talks about JED, so I will just jump right in um, since time is very short, given I want to leave a lot of time for the case because I do believe it will generate a lot of questions and conversations. So um, <clears throat> my, my hope today is to talk with you a little bit about Jed's approach, our comprehensive approach, um, and our public health approach to promoting mental health and preventing suicide. Um, our next slide, <clears throat> please. Um, our mission really is to promote positive mental health and reduce suicide and significant substance misuse among teens and young adults. We do that primarily by, by working in high schools and colleges um, with their pro uh, programs, policies, systems around these issues to best support um, student well-being. So JED, for those of you who aren't familiar with the JED Foundation, um, we're about 20 years, 21 years maybe now, founded by a couple, Donna and Phil Saitow, whose son JED died by suicide. Um, before they started the foundation. And when they spoke with the folks at his school um, at the time, they, they came away, the, the administration very genuinely and in a sincere way, you know, said, what would you have us do, you know, around these issues? You know, we're a school of 20,000 plus students, you know, what should we be doing? And that really motivated them to start the foundation um, originally in a very sort of, if you will, um, microscopic way, only on suicide prevention narrowly defined, and soon learned that if we want to move the needle on reducing suicides, we need to really move upstream on promoting positive mental health toward the end of hopefully reducing suicides. So that's a little bit about Jed. Next. Our approach is really a public health approach. Um, to promote emotional well-being and prevent suicide and substance misuse. And by public health approach, we mean two main things. The first and most important is that the responsibility for supporting student well-being is a campus-wide responsibility. It should no longer be falling exclusively or even primarily to health and counseling centers. While they have certainly a very important role to play, they are only one very small cog in a very large wheel. And so we, we promote and encourage schools to engage everyone on their campus, not in being therapists, but in being support folks so that there's no wrong door for a student to walk through for a warm hand, uh, a question about whether or not they're okay, some encouragement so that faculty, coaches, academic advisors, administrative assistants, security, dining folks, you name it on campus, people who are in contact with your students are educated about how to look out for someone who might be struggling, not crisis, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but when that light bulb goes off, hmm, you know, Nancy looks a little off today. How you doing? Is everything okay? You look you look sort of off today. Whatever. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But but the notion being everyone being aware and knowing that it's their responsibility as well to support student health in a human being to human being kind of way, not as a therapist. And secondly, important to have support from the top down. We have found that if your senior, you know, your president, your board, your VPs, if, if you don't have senior leadership on board in promoting student mental health in a public health approach where everyone has a role to play, then you really won't move the needle in any kind of long-term systemic way. We, have, we work with about 400 schools right now across the country, and we've learned this again and again in our work with schools. Next slide. So for those of you who haven't seen this, and it's on our website, uh, this is our comprehensive approach. Um, it consists of seven domains, um, including developing life skills, 
fostering connectedness and a sense of belonging, um, increasing help seeking, um, <clears throat> looking at direct services like your health and counseling services, crisis intervention, um, and means restriction. And so I'll talk about each one very quickly because I want to get into the case. But we, this model originated, for those of you who may not be aware, it's the only evidence-based model we're aware of that's out there and originated about 21 years ago with the Air Force, believe it or not. And the Air Force implemented this model, of course, in a slightly different way. We've adapted it for use with teens and young adults, but the, the domains and, and whatnot um, the same. And they demonstrated a statistically significant reduction in suicides. And when this model was consistently, and I should put that in bold in big letters, consistently implemented on their bases, um, and anecdotally found, even though they weren't looking for this, a reduction in domestic violence and substance misuse. The problem, of course, is that unfortunately, the model is not consistently and standardly implemented on bases across the country at this moment. So that's another conversation for another time. But I just wanted you to know that's where the model evolved. We didn't make it up. Um, we then adapted it um, for use with college and um, high school students. Next slide. So very quickly, I'm going to run through, you will get the slides and I want to leave time for the case. So I'm just going to quickly run through each, each domain. So life skills, um, helping students with things like developing resilience, you know, working through interpersonal relationships, resolving conflicts, um, managing, you probably all have things on like study skills, time management, things like that. But we're, we're talking in addition to that, things like, you know, how do you live with someone who's different from you? How do you deal with disappointment? You know, when you get that first B and you think your life is over, you know, how, or you didn't make the team, you know, we're finding and we're hearing from many schools that students are very ill-equipped to deal with even what we might consider to be small disappointments. So providing opportunities for students to develop life skills, and this is a great one to demonstrate. This certainly does not need to be done in a health or counseling center. This can be done in a dean's office, in an academic advising situation, in an athletic situation. So again, think broadly about where this kind of program and workshops and information can be delivered. Next. Promoting social connectedness. Again, easily seen how this can be fostered and supported across um, the campus community. Uh, we know that loneliness is the single biggest struggle that first years report, in particular first years. So how are we providing opportunities for students to find their way, find their niche, find their group? You know, most first years don't come to campus and have a ready-made group that they're friends with, right? So, you know, you go to dinner for the first time and where do you sit? You know, so how are we offering opportunities for students to gather organically um, to develop, to develop connections, you know, some schools may have a, an upper class person, you know, paired with a, a first year student, there's many different ways that people do this and campuses do this, but really looking at how are you promoting a sense of belonging and connectedness on your campus, the notion being with the public health approach and the campus wide responsibility and connectedness is we're trying to develop the goal is to develop a culture of caring and compassion on your campus. Again, where there's no wrong door to walk through for a warm hand. <clears throat> so this is a particular um, sort of highlighted way that people do this. Looking sp specifically at populations or in particular at populations that may traditionally be, feel more isolated or disconnected on your campus. You know, if you're a campus of predominantly white students and faculty, you know, how do your students of color, for example, uh, develop a sense of belonging on your campus? Or they, there's a very small LGBTQ plus group on your campus. You know, any group that may be, I hate the word marginalized, but I will use it for lack of a better term. Um, 
on your, or, or less, not the traditional student on your campus? Are you looking at ways that they may also feel isolated, disconnected, and helping to support them in their journey at your school? So really thinking about, we, there is just FYI, if you want to look at it, our equity and mental health framework that we developed with the Steve Fund, um, which you can Google, and there's uh, recommendations for how to support uh, particularly students of color on your campus, but many of the things are applicable to other groups as well. Next, identifying students at risk. This is where I would like to change this to identifying students who might be struggling, because I think if we wait until a student is at risk, we've missed the boat. So again, moving the needle way upstream, and this is where folks other than clinicians have a significant role to play. You know, if I'm a faculty member and I notice Nancy's been quiet in class and she's usually talkative, you know, at that moment, I should be reaching out to Nancy and saying, hey, is everything okay? You've been kind of quiet lately. You know, certainly know that if I reveal something, you know, acute, know where to get me professional help. But more often than not, it's that warm hand, it's that outreach from someone who is organically in your community that can go such a long way to help a student feel connected, that somebody cares about them. And following up, you know, a few days later, hey, you know, is, is everything better? Has, has things changed or might I be able to help? Um, again, not to be a therapist, but to, it, it's the same thing as if you're sitting in your office and that you share with a coworker and you notice that person, you know, seems not to be themselves. You normally would just say, hey, is everything okay? That's what we're talking about. And I can tell you that when we talk with faculty, especially who often sometimes you know, are resistant to this, um, it's not because they don't care. It's, it's usually because they're afraid they're gonna say the wrong thing or make matters worse and they don't feel equipped. And I don't blame them if you're asking them to figure out if someone's depressed or anxious or suicidal, or it makes sense that they would feel intimidated or ill-equipped for that. But when you move the conversation to what I just described, we can see the visible signs of relief come over faculty's faces and, oh, I can do that. I, I can say that, uh, you know, as long as you're not asking me X, Y, and Z. So, so again, uh, you can read the slides for other things, but that, that's the gist of what we're trying to get at here is identifying way upstream, reaching out in a, in a very sort of <laughs> the word that comes to mind is pedestrian kind of way, a very, you know, simple kind of way. And then certainly knowing where to get someone the help that they might need if they reveal a significant issue. Next. Increasing help seeking behavior. Again, this no wrong door for support, letting students know that we're all available to, to help within our limited capacities. Um, the culture of caring, having mental health be something that's easily discussed and, and publicly discussed on your campus. Storytelling is a great way, especially if you have faculty or staff on your campus who have had struggles and are willing to talk about their journey and how they've then arrived at where they are right now. So stories of struggle and hope and, and, and positive messaging. Um, many things here, online screening tools. Um, you know, most college counseling centers are overwhelmed. Uh, I mean, that's not new. It may be even more so now, but not everyone on campus needs direct clinical service. So how are we supporting those students that, that could benefit from some support, but don't necessarily need clinical care? Um, there's, you know, most schools have also are now considering teletherapy if you haven't already, because COVID sort of helped us all move to that in many places. Um, so many different ways that we can increase help seeking and direct service. Next. Providing uh, services. Again, uh, I will say the most important thing about this, and you can read all the other things, is um, having primary care screen for mental health. Um, that we know so many more students go to the health center than will ever go to the counseling center. And so we miss a large number of students who may be struggling with mental health concerns um, if we're not screening in primary care or at your health center. Um, and then there's a whole piece I can talk about on how um, for those who screen with just mild to moderate symptomatology, how they could be held 
in primary care um, because you can, again, you can refer to counseling all day long and oftentimes they're never gonna go. So what can we be doing um, <clears throat> alternatively? And, and that's, another, that's another presentation. Um, lots of communication between health and counseling, thinking about your triage system. Are you getting kids in quickly? How do you do that to evaluate whether they're acute or not and what they need? Lots of suggestions for that. Um, a referral system, you know, not just here's three names, good luck. Um, we all know that trying to get into a practice um, is, is very difficult. So really knowing you know, who in your community is available, who knows about college health, um, my battery's about to die, so let me plug in before I lose you. Um, <clears throat> you know, what, do they have a sliding scale? What insurance do they take? What's their wait list like? Do you have partnerships with them? What kind of information is going to be shared? That's another whole thing on referrals that we could talk about. Um, so, oh my goodness, hold on, I'm sorry. I hate to keep getting a message, although I plugged in. I'm sorry. Well, I'm just going to try and go on next. We can still hear you pretty good, Nance, if you talk just a little bit louder, okay. if you can't get it to stop. Yep. You can. OK. Crisis management. This is where we're talking about what this case is going to be about today. Medical leaves, um, our recommendation around medical leaves, which I'll try and interweave to the case presentation, mandatory leaves. Um, you know, the, the notion behind them is making them user friendly, making them supportive for students you know, so that it's a positive experience. And, and I can talk more about that during the case presentation. Um, looking at your insurance policies, tuition insurance being key if you're not offering it, um, a medical amnesty and, and postvention. If you don't have a postvention policy, I strongly encourage you to look at the HEMA, it's the Higher Education Mental Health Association postvention guide. That's a group of all the people in this space. So us, APA, AU, Triple C, D, every NASPA coming together with that group. Um, the postvention protocol is excellent. Take from it what fits for your school, but it, it really goes through from soup to nuts. Next. And restricting access to lethal, lethal means. This is the only, this is the single evidence-based practice we know of that prevent suicide. If you don't have access to lethal mean, you're not going to die by suicide. So looking at where on campus are there places where students could bring harm to themselves, you know, bridges, atriums, you know, windows and tall buildings that, that, you know, open more than two inches, prescription drug monitoring, you know, drug collection policies, firearms policies, as much, a lot here. And I'm sorry to be rushing through it, but I do want to leave time for the case. So I'm, I'm going to stop talking. I believe that's, that's it for me. If you, yeah. So thank you. And I'm sorry for rushing, but I do want to leave time for the case. And if folks are interested in talking further about any of the domains and the things that are on those slides that we recommend and have lots of thoughts about, um, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Nan, so much. We really appreciate it. Um, we're about, you know, at 1230 here, so we do have time for some questions. Does anybody have any questions for Nance? Um, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and go for it. It looks like Margaret may have her hand raised. Am I reading that right? Or is that my, nope, sorry, that's me. Okay. My crazy computer. I will say uh, Carolyn threw in some links in there to some resources. Um, be sure to check those out. Um, and we can also include those in the recap email. But are there any the links that, that <laughs> underneath my name will take you to the Jed Foundation website, also our Jed Campus program. Um, and I do strongly encourage you to go to our website. There's so, if you haven't already, there's tons of free resources 
um, our Seize the Awkward campaign, which continually gets updated that we've done with the Ad Council is excellent. And you can download, download those little videos. We've gotten really positive feedback about that campaign, not only in terms of numbers of uh, folks who look at it and share it, but also the Ad Council is doing um, metrics further down the road, like after six months to, to the folks who have seen the, the um, snippets, if, if it's actually changed behaviors and we're finding um, st statistically significant uh, findings that of behavioral activation, that is, having seen the campaign, have you actually done something differently? Have you reached out to a friend? Have you said something? And, and that's great to see that, that it's having that impact. Great. Okay, I noticed while Nance was presenting, we've had uh, a handful of people just join. Um, so welcome to those new to, uh, to, the, to the session. Um, just want to say one more time, please put your name, email, organization, and your credentials in the chat if you have not done so for attendance and also CE credit uh, for those who just joined or joined a little bit later. Um, and if you can, put your video on. That's great. Uh, but we know uh, it is lunchtime, so we understand. Um, we are going to transition into the um, case presentation. Now, just a couple of things on the case and how they kind of work in ECHO. So the case is going to be a de-identified uh, case presentation. Um, we're going to share, I'm going to share my screen and share the case form. The presenter by no means has to read it word for word. This is just to give everybody kind of walk through it on a real high you know, level overview of the case. But what we really want you to present on as the presenter, whoever would be that presenter, is to ask the questions you want to know. Um, and ask them, you know, kind of what you see the issue being in the case or how to deal with a certain situation. And then we can have a discussion around those questions. But at least by sharing the, the screen and sharing the case, people can kind of read through it on their own a little bit as we're talking about it. Uh, but it's up there for reference. Um, I'll leave it up there for, you know, a good while. But then I'm also going to stop the share. So then it's a little bit easier for people to see everyone and kind of pick out the questions. But that's typically how they work. Um, the case presentation part from the presenter should be about five to 10 minutes, not very long. Like I said, we just want to get the, the main points and then we'll have the open discussion. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, I'm going to share my screen and I believe Candice Lane and Nikki Barr are listed. I see Candice. Is Nikki here? I just can't see all the Hollywood squares, but I do see Candice. Uh, so yeah. thank you. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, great. Now you just popped up. Yeah. Feel free to stay unmuted. Let me share my screen and I will turn it over to you and I'll just wa walk us through it and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Um, Nikki and I, I'm our director and assistant director of the Counseling Center at Marshall. And um, I will read it word for word. And if Nikki wants to add anything, sure. And then we'll um, let you have it and open it up for questions and how you want it to go. Um, and so at Marshall, we have encountered some students who may have, you know, if, not may, who do have severe mental health concerns um, and looking at whether they fit into our scope of practice. So some questions that we would like answered or just discussed, processed, you know, how are other schools handling the, the rapid increase of counseling center utilization? Um, during the fall 2021 semester, we saw more students in that one semester than we did the entire academic year the year prior. So we, we'd like to get some insight into how other schools are handling that and if you're seeing um, similar increases. What resources are schools providing to students with severe mental health concerns? And at what point are you contacting emergency contacts for students? And at what point um, do we ethically and legally um, may need to assist the student in um, focusing on their mental health and how maybe we can offer them education services in a, in a different um, context so that they can focus on mental health? So how schools are handling that. So I will read the background. Um, the student is a non-traditional transfer student living in housing and residence life. 
client has previously tried to apply to an on-campus success resource, but was not accepted due to psychological and behavioral diagnoses concerns that did not fit into the scope of the program. And I will add the student was not um, denied to come to Marshall, but was just denied for the specific program. So decided during that, time, that year to not come to Marshall at all. Um, the student applied again the following year and was accepted after contacting the service several times and threatening to sue. The student was connected with the counseling center after a professor and housing and residence life staff submitted care reports which are reports that go to the behavior intervention team on campus and to the counseling center director and assistant director. The student was connected with counseling and psychiatric services. The student presented with psychotic symptoms, having outbursts and difficulty managing emotions in class um, in tutoring sessions and in other parts of campus. After verbalizing harm in the residence halls, the on-call counselor was contacted the student voluntarily decided to go to the hospital for a psychiatric assessment and was transported by ambulance. The student, student ended up leaving the ER before the medical clearance was completed. The student was assisted in going back to the hospital and told the hospital there was no longer any harm or threat to self. The student was discharged. After another outburst on campus in the counseling center, campus police was contacted and a mental hygiene was conducted. After meeting for the interview hearing, the student verbalized no harm and the hydrant was dropped. The student continued to exhibit psychotic behavior on campus, paranoia, accusing others on campus of treating him differently due to race, sexuality, and also having delusions. Several professors and staff in various programs wrote reports and concerns about the student. After continuing behaviors and difficulty discussion with the student's family and various campus staff, the student decided to go home and withdraw. He was offered online courses and was referred to counseling and psychiatric resources local um, to the student. The concerns that were presented um, included the student being fit. And again, I put that in quotation marks because you know that's, that's a hard thing to do ethically um, to live in the halls and, and attend courses, but a student cannot be kicked out due to mental health concerns. There were behavior concerns that student, con student conduct was aware of and there was a case in the student conduct office. Only behaviors can be used to suspend, expel a student. So what services are provided if a student doesn't fit into the counseling center scope of care? How do we assist students that mental health concerns may cause other students to feel uncomfortable? So what did we do um, thus far? Um, the student has since withdrawn from the, the university. Um, the following services were provided to the student, counseling and psychiatric services, um, even a, an emergency psychiatric um, appointment with our doctors, Student Success Center, intensive tutoring, case management, case staffing, including family emergency contacts, staffing with housing and residence life, involvement of the Dean and the VP of Student Affairs, referral to community crisis team and hospital assessment, and also assisted with packing belongings and transported to the local bus station. If you see highlighted, these are the um, resources on campus and in the community that we connected with. Um, with this student and I, I failed to highlight parents that that should be highlighted as well. We, we connected with an emergency contact and, and several family members um, as the student contacted them himself and also us as well. Candice, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna scroll back up to the top. Nikki, did you have anything to add before we do some questions? No, I do not. Okay. Okay, great job, Candice. Thank you for being the first one uh, to present a case. You did great. Uh, so now what typically happens is we ask for what we call clarifying questions. So if anybody has a follow-up question to you, just declare any anything that was presented on the in your in your case. And then after clarifying questions, then we open it up for all takers. Uh, that want to uh, ask questions. I see a raised hand though from Nance. Nance, why don't you go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. Um, can you say what is a mental hygiene? You said um, a, a mental hygiene was conducted. Can you say what that is? That is if a, that is us petitioning to the courts to um, have this, this student um, go before assessment. 
Um, the hospital also did this as well because the student was threatening behaviors but kept leaving but kept changing the story. And so to get the student more services, we performed a mental hygiene, which is you know going to a, a hearing to see if he can be required to have uh, mental health services. So like a court court, like a like a, a public court, like outside the school court. Yes, because he was exhibiting harm like in the hospital and even the, the hospital contacted us and encouraged us to file the mental hygiene warrant um, because he just kept leaving and they wanted it. They also filed one as well. Well, and because he was a harm to himself and um, everyone on campus, he had made threats to hurt other people on campus as well as himself. It wasn't just yet. Yeah, he had self-harm. He had marks on his body. And so for safety reasons, you know, it's called a mental hygiene in West Virginia. Other states may be different, um, but that's the process that we took at that time. So just so I'm clear, so as opposed to simply putting him on a medical leave, which all of the indicators are there that you would put him on a medical leave, even if it was involuntary. We did that eventually after the, the hygiene, because after that. He agreed to go voluntarily in the beginning, so that's why medical leave was not done then, because he agreed to voluntarily go and get help, but left. Thank you. And that is a question that, that we had, you know, when do you just automatically stop the services and say, this is a medical leave, this is a required medical leave? I, I think I've read too many legal cases of, of counseling centers and directors getting sued when it comes to saying whether or not you're fit to be here. And I just personally won't take the liberty to do that or say that. And I think, you know, that comes from a, a variety of sources in our behavior intervention team, us staffing with them, the VP, the dean of students. Um, and I think the counselors should, should stay out of that somewhat. Great, great question, Nance. Let's throw it to uh, T. Ann Hawkins. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, Candace and others. Um, Candace, what a great presentation and um, um, what a challenging case. I think it's one that's familiar to all of us. Um, so two questions. One is, was the, was the, and you may have said this, and if I missed it, I apologize. I was trying to scarf down my lunch. Mm -hmm. um, was the medical leave involuntary? And two, do you have case managers? And I think your model is a short-term model. Can you can you clarify? Yes, we we have a short-term model. We offer 10 sessions per semester, but flexible. Um, we we will go over that, but rare. Um, we saw a thousand students in last semester and about um, almost a hundred had over those 10 sessions. So we do pretty well staying in that. Um, we try to keep it to where it was voluntary. You know, you know, we want you to be able to make this decision first, you know, and, and us providing you resources. Um, he was able to do that, but if he had not, it would have been involuntary just because of the continued um, disruptions and just behaviors and his need for assistance and help. There was a lot of, um, sorry, Candace, I don't mean to interrupt you. There was a lot of, um, and why this doesn't seem like, and it probably appears to be very black, why it should have been, um, he should have did a voluntary medical withdrawal, or we should have did involuntary, but there were a lot of um, threats of lawsuits um, from family that made this all a very, very sticky situation too. We're really trying to tread lightly somewhat and, and try to get the voluntary. Um, and did, Tian, did I answer all of your questions? And We do, have, oh, you asked about a case manager. We have yeah. a case manager now, um, but we did not then. That, yeah, that's helpful. I, part of the reason I ask about case management, and I know that that's a luxury that many centers don't have right now, is with some of our high-risk cases that fall outside of a short-term model, that's often the approach that we take, which is, is providing more regular um, case management. It's definitely a luxury. When we're in, in the, you know, we just got one, and honestly, you know, with the way our services are and, and the utilization we could have probably three uh, and it you know they all would have you know full load um but you know hopefully we can keep increasing that great um let's see let's throw it to cynthia 
Hi, Candace, and thanks for the presentation. Um, great, great case and lots of things to think about. Um, I'm struck by the, the first sentence of your case that talked about that he had applied previously to an on-campus success resource. What kind of um, success resource did he apply to that turned him down because of psychological um, issues? Because it seems like that would be the prime group of people who may need that success resource. And trying not to actually identify the resource, the resource um, does provide services to students that have learning disabilities, ADHD and different things. So it was a little outside of those diagnoses um, and, and even the, the learning difficulties that they usually um, include in their program. The communication went awry a little bit there. And, and, and again, you learn from things and situ in these cases, again, um, hopefully things aren't missed in the future. This is, you know, so good that we're doing this. But I think once the student was admitted, maybe that program should have communicated and said, hey, we have a very severe case here. We allowed, we admitted him this time. Um, let's go ahead and set up services. That would have been the ideal approach. The services were set up after the first outburst. And the counseling center and other directors that are on here may be able to agree. Um, and Marshall's amazing. I love it that they've really been listening to us. So this is not talking about the university, but uh, you know, I think sometimes a lot of universities use the counseling center as the, the help. Let's, well, you know, we're waving the flag, we can't do anymore, we're done. And I think things maybe, you know, we, we all need to work on making things a little bit. Um, more preventative. But any suggestions, please give us, a, you know, <laughs> we'll take them all. <laughs> Thanks, Candace. I, I would just say one thing. Um, you and Nikki both mentioned the threat of lawsuits. And um, some of you know my background. I was a CEO of a psychiatric health system for about seven years. So I learned in that that you do what's right for the person and you worry about the legal stuff later. Um, so always do what's right for the person in the moment and worry about the, the threat of lawsuits later. That's what you have lawyers for. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that is helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Oh, go ahead, Nance. I just, I just want to add in, right, because I'm just, it's exactly what I want to talk about following Cynthia. I, I just want to clarify, I think, confusion that many institutions talk with us about, and that is at what point can a school put a student on a medical leave when they're not agreeing to do so? And there's been a lot of confusion since Title II came out when it was only if a student's homicidal can you put them on a medical leave. That, that guidance has been misinterpreted. And if any of you have, I'm sure you all have attorneys you know, on your campus or who deal with your school, their group, the American Association of College and University Attorneys, has many, many, many cases that they can read and they can share with you that I've been able to, to look at myself, where the, the notion of Title II, that was set up to stop schools from putting kids on medical leave if they cut or if they express suicidal ideation or, you know, the schools were very quick to, if you will, kick kids out if they expressed any kind of risk, right? You can't do that. <laughs> and so that's really what that was meant to, to do. But it was taken to an extreme where schools felt like I can never put a student on medical leave because they're going to sue me or I'm going to get sued. And that's true. That is actually not true. The notion is if you as a school, you have to put everything in place that's reasonably possible for you to help the students stay in school and be successful. Be that treatment, they might need a reduced course load, they might need a change in housing, that any number of things right, that you can offer to help the students stay in school and be successful and document that and document that and document that, right? That you've, and the response of the student refused or in spite of all of the things that you've tried, the student is still a very high risk to themselves or others. There's no case that I've read in the AACU, you know, case studies where a school has been found liable, if you will, or responsible or, you know, irresponsible, I guess, um, where they've done that, 
where they've done due diligence, tried everything under the sun, you know, documented it all. And still at that point, if you put a student on medical leave, I've not seen a case where the school has been fined or, you know, not to say you might not get a suit, <laughs> but it's not settled and, you know, it's settled in the school's favor because they've done the right thing. So I just want to make that clear because there's so much confusion around that, um, that I just, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> no, that, that, that was so helpful. And that's what we needed because, you know, and I wish I could have just binged you and Cynthia at that moment. <laughs> It would have been great. <laughs> Snappy, you know, being you guys into it to our meeting and help. Um, but I think that's what it is. I think, you know, we were all scared. Uh, Nikki and I were like, we're not putting our license numbers on this, you know. Um, we're going to do, and we did do due diligence. And then at that point, at, we said, okay, we can't. <laughs> this is, it's it's exhausting all of our resources um, for a solid three three weeks. Um, and so this helps a lot. And I was even writing down and, you know, I'm glad we have this recording so we can feel better moving forward if this happens again. And, even and I'll just say, reviewing. check with your attorneys as well, just to confirm, like I'm not an attorney, but right. from all the cases I've read from the American Association of College and University Attorneys cases, uh, you, you can see the ones where students, where schools have, gotten sued and rightly so because they didn't do all the things I just you know they they in it you know quickly impulsively put kids on leave without doing any of the support stuff so you can read cases on both sides which is helpful and I think in this case we, we, we would have been fine we did way more than we probably should you know could have should have um but this helps a lot thank you Great questions, great discussion. Uh, thanks for everybody putting their comments in the chat. Very helpful. Um, Chelsea, you have your hand raised. You're up next. I, I do, thank you. Candace, I apologize <clears throat> if you if you already said this. I, I don't have that screen up with your case, but this student, after made, he made threats and was um, sent to the hospital and discharged, was he placed back in housing on campus? Yes, with... Um... That was staffed before he returned. Um, we were concerned about their roommate and we were getting, you know, offering their roommate another place. And the roommate was like, absolutely not. He's fine, one come back. So we did go through that. Um, but during his different emotions and mood and, and where he was in psych psychosis, he would be fine some days and it would be like, oh, I'm okay. And you go to class and be perfectly fine. But yes, that, that was a concern. And we did RAs were, you know, checking in the, the area coordinators. Um, but his, you know, even talking to his roommate, the roommate was completely okay and actually wanted wanted the student to return. Okay. Thank you. Shocked. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't see any in the chat and I don't see anybody else's hand. Nance. I could talk all day long on medical leave. So pardon me for jumping in Please. so much, but since <laughs> no one else raised their hand, I figured I could jump in. Um, just a couple of thoughts about, uh, well, first of all, an answer to your question about how are schools managing the crazy numbers of students that you're you know, asked to service. I will go back to what I was talking about in my presentation, which is that campus-wide responsibility. <laughs> um, because I don't think that huge increase that you're seeing are all kids who actually need direct clinical service. I think a lot of kids, especially right now, are anxious and are nervous about coming back to school during the pandemic. And that kind of stuff no, it doesn't always rise to the level of a clinical concern. And so let's sort of sh share the responsibility for those that might and help reduce the numbers, you know, that are coming in to your service that maybe could be served elsewhere or in other, other ways. But I did want to say a couple things about, you know, the student went to the ER and was released and left because he, he or she, he wasn't seen, you know, we know you can wait for a long time in the ER, right? One of the things that when I, I was on campus for 
a hundred years before I joined Jed. I was a director of a health and counseling center. I was a direct service provider. I was a, a dean, blah, blah, blah. One of the things that we found to be very helpful and that we recommend at Jed is when you're sending a student to the, the hospital and they go through the ER, if you can send in advance a summary sheet of, of the, what you're observing at school in the student, um, and if you have insurance information and stuff like that, that's helpful to also include. But your your clinical observations of what you've seen, because in this case, the student, and oftentimes the students say, oh, no, I didn't, you know, I'm fine. I'm blah, 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 right? And yet an hour ago when you saw them, they were very high risk. So sending in advance to the ER your clinical summary, and if possible, whoever goes, like on my campuses, someone went with the student to the ER, not just the campus police or the emergency vehicle, and they stayed. They made sure that paper <laughs> with the information got to, you know, the triage people and stayed till the student was was taken back, if you will. Um, helps to reduce what happened in this case where, and this happens all the time, students will say they'll deny, 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 and then the hospital has nothing to go on. But if they have the data, they can ask more pointed questions and do a more thorough and thoughtful exam because they have the school's, you know, experience of the student in advance. So I just offer that as a, as a like idea. We've never done like an actual um, paper and that that's a great idea. Pre COVID, we would actually go there and sit with the student. Um, ever since COVID and the new rules, we stopped that. And what we do is we provide our on call cell phone. We were able to speak with the nurses there. So that did help, but I do think the the hard copy is that's wonderful and and maybe something we should consider is again we do communicate with them but it's not you know the, a written summary thank you all right we are about three minutes out so we're gonna do some housekeeping here to wrap up the session but let me thank again candace and nikki for the case presentation great job uh nance for the didactic critique presentation and everybody's uh, questions uh, during the uh, discussion. This is great. This is how we hope these sessions will be moving forward. Um, typically, what happens after the session, uh, you receive a recap email that will include the slides. It'll include the private link to the YouTube uh, channel so you can watch the recording. Um, it'll also have information about the next session, which will actually be uh, here in two weeks. Um, and then um, you will also, as the case presenters, Candace and Nikki, you will get a separate email where we will jot down in that case form, if you saw that last box had the kind of recommendations or just tidbits on there, we'll put some of those in there, like talking about the form that we just talked about that you could send to the ER, you know, things like that. We'll put those in there so you hopefully don't have to go back through the uh, video and try to find all the answers. I mean, obviously feel free to do that, but we'll put those in there and just send those to you since you are the presenters. Um, that's typically how we do it. Um, so those are the kind of things to be looking out for. And then you also get a reminder uh, before the session comes up, uh, the next session. Use this link again, the registration link you got. It's the same one. It's unique to you, so you can join. Um, if you have any questions about that, if you have any questions or issues with Zoom, please feel free to reach out. Um, but in the meantime, uh, you know, we wish everybody the, a great rest of the week. Thank you so much for everybody coming on. It was a great group, and we look forward to the future sessions. Everybody take care. <laughs>